After two and a half years of a pandemic, it's great to be in a room with people. The pandemic has really accelerated the adoption of technology, I think you'll find. And although a lot of people have suffered through it, it's really pushed the boundaries and the possibilities of how we can work remotely and really accelerated the growth. If only I had shares in Zoom, eh? Although we embraced the working from home directive, the technology does not replace the factor of the human being. I think that um, we're social creatures, we need human interaction, and we're very habitual, and for most, we don't particularly like change. See, we're hardwired to resist change. Part of the brain, it interprets change as a threat, and therefore puts a barrier up to it. And that's why many people in many organizations struggle with the change, and that is the challenge for innovation in so many places. I think that maybe my brain is wired slightly differently. I've spent my career looking at how we can do things differently, particularly around automation, how we can do things more efficiently, faster, and save time. And so um, I've always been pushing the boundaries of the industry to do things in a better manner. Remember these guys? So let's just cast your mind back. 1962, the Jetsons came out with their so-called flying cars, and the actual scene was set in 2062. So we have 40 years to go, and we've already got a guy with a jet suit. So it just shows you that all the way back then, the cartoon world was maybe predicting the future. Jetsons certainly got it right with Trump, so maybe. They're onto something there. I want to just raise some statements, first of all, for you guys to think about while we're talking. And I want you to think about the statements that I'm making, how they impact on our industry. And if we think about today's technology, out of date within the next three to five years, how will that affect a construction life cycle? How will we actually do our traditional supply chain procurement up front, looking at the technology that may be out of date by the time the building comes alive. And a building needs to be alive before it can be smart. And that was a, a phrase that was coined when I was doing some work with Google. And it was about the data sets. And it was about without data-rich environment, you cannot make smart happen. And when we repeat the last process, we get the same results. And if any of you have seen my LinkedIn, I've got this hashtag insanity thing that I run with. Because of, for all the years that I've worked in the industry, I see a lot of repetition happening with process. And technology is disrupting everything that we do within our industry. And so we have to change the way that we were processing. Everything has to change to incorporate technology to get it work for us. That includes supply chain, contracting, how we design, how we develop, and how we operate buildings in the future. So how do we think we're doing? So I've done some research for this presentation and looked at where does the industry or the, the KPMGs and the... Um, other guys out there think about where construction is with digitization. And it's a bit of a bad story, and I'm not sure whether I really believe it. It says that we're down in sector six, where we're saying we're actually not very digitized as a construction industry. But I know that for many, many years, there's been some fantastic digital tools at our hands. So I don't know why there's the perception that maybe we're not as digital as we could be. And maybe it's just because the research they're doing is more about a broader construction industry and not the design industry. So we need to think about, are we the first adopters? Are we the laggards? Where do we sit? Are we in the void, maybe? Do we have access to all the digital tools, but maybe we don't have the adoption to, to take them up because of maybe the way that we're being asked to design and build buildings doesn't allow us to do so? And have anybody here heard of singularity? 
It's the concept that technology will accelerate at such a rate of pace of rate, we will, it will overtake and it will be out of control of actually what we do. And technology and products have always been designed by humans that then monitor how well the technology is working and then reimagine it and redefine it to make it a better product. But now, design is done by machines, with machines, for machines. So we have an exponential rate of acceleration. And that means that our technology progress is going at such a rate of knots, it's very, very difficult for us humans to keep up with it. And Ray Kurzweil is a futurist, and if you, uh, if you Google him, he's got some really, really interesting studies about how the human biological is becoming more of the technical, and about how they're now transitioning from machines that are designing machines. And I think it's a bit of an irony that when you go onto a website now and fill some information in, You've got a robot asking you if you're a robot. The iPhone came out 2007, January. They've had 33 versions of the iPhone in just a short period of time. And every version has been a slightly better than the previous one. So maybe we'll get to version 56 very, very soon. But the concept behind that was to do with the technology adoption and about the need that we have, the hunger, to have technology. So you have a phone, you have it a few years, there's nothing wrong with it, but Apple bring out a new one. And you have a compelling motion to, I need a new upgrade. There's nothing wrong with your old phone. And so where I'm going with this is that we need to be very, very careful around the hype involved in the smart buildings industry, and about not being drawn into the clickbait of the technology that's going to apparently be the silver bullet for all of our problems. And we need to think about how we structure our building designs to have really, really good, robust infrastructure, data sets, communications, because they are the foundation that's going to make the building smart and future-proof it. It took 63 years for the telephone to be adopted in the US. And when I say adopted, that's to get to over 70% of, um, of the adoption in the, um, the US population. The smartphone took about seven. And that's because it wasn't just a phone, it did a lot more than that. And again, it's this hunger, this need for shiny technology. So again, in my role, we do a lot of work where we do a lot of research into technology, a lot of emerging things that are coming out of us, but we have to make some choices of, does the technology solve a problem? Will it be adopted, and can I scale it? Which is the most important things for us to think about when we're talking about smart buildings. Because you could have the best technology in the world, but if no one's going to really use it, then it's useless. So we really need to think about if I put some tech in a building, how many people are going to use it? Particularly when we talk about things like customer experience. And I know that customer experience is being the thing that's thrown out now to try and uh, sell the dream. And customer experience is very, very important, but it's very, very difficult to put an ROI on. So if we are spending money putting technology into a building for our customers to use, we need to make sure that it's going to get adoption and the customers are going to get really good value out of it. Back in 2012, Deloitte came out with a really interesting paper called The Short Fuse Big Bang. And it was about Australia, the lucky country, it was about the Australian economy. And it was talking about the disruption that's happening with technology, how long a sector has got they are disrupted, and how big the disruption will be. And this is a slide from the report. It's free to download. I suggest you have a read of it. It's really interesting. And although it's slightly, you know, 10 years ago, there was a, a revision done of it a few years ago, and it looks like 
things pretty much that they predicted back then have happened. And if you have a look at the top left quadrant, you'll see there retail got smashed by online trading. ICT, massive disruption to that. And have a look at construction, and it's sitting there from 2012. It looks like it was 2014. It was right on the really not much of a bang at all. And that was because they couldn't see back in the day what technology was going to really impact the construction industry. So I think if we move forward now, we are right in the middle. Sorry, we're not in the middle. We're probably 20% in to a massive transformation between digitization of our industry and also about the change process that has to happen to adopt that digitization. So let's talk about the future and see where things are heading. If we look at the Gartner hype cycle, things at the top of the curve at the moment about the digital workplace. So this was only produced in 2020. It's quite relevant. And we look at the things that are coming up the curve. So things like, um, yeah, smart workplace, workplace analytics, they're all the things that people are talking about right now, this moment. Now, it's a hype cycle. It doesn't mean to say that these things are going to be adopted, right? It's just what people are talking about right now. And it's very interesting that things that have gone down into our trough of disillusionment are things about, you know, um, internet as a service, desktop of a service, people came up with those ideas and they didn't really take off, so they're not really delivering value. And I always try to reference to Gartner because they're a really, really good research um, institution and they give you some good ideas of where things are heading. But I also found this, which was done by Oxford, Uni um, Oxford University. And there's some concerning things on this high cycle. And if we have a look at the things down in the trough of disillusionment, you're talking about IoT, in digital twinning. I wondered why they were sat down in the trough when we talked about such a lot in the industry. And they had quite a lot of market presence. I think with digital twinning, my perception is if you talk to five people about the digital twin, you'll possibly get five variations of what it may or may not be. And I think for us as an industry, we need to think about how we clarify what a digital twin is and the value it provides. There's a lot of hype around it, and there's a lot of confusion around it, and it can be different things to different people. I think that's probably one of the things why, at the moment, people like portfolio owners and building operators are not sure about the digital twin because they're not sure about the value it can provide. Not saying it doesn't, but it's because of there's not enough clarity around what it does. BIM. So I remember working on BIM projects back in London, and... Back in the day, there was a bit of resistance towards BIM because they thought it was going to cost a lot of money to do because they didn't realize the efficiencies that it can provide. And it was always a bit of a challenge to get BIM over the line. These days, we've progressed way on beyond that now, and BIM is becoming a little bit more of a, a norm. In the UK, BIM has been standardized. Standards have actually been um, ratified by government and so you can't do a construction project without certain BIM requirements now in the UK, which I think is a really, really good thing. And I think BIM does give you really, really good value going forward, but only, again, like I was saying, if it gives you really good access to data sets. So I started my career back in the early 80s in Petrochem. And in the world of process control, Things are very, very different to commercial buildings, obviously. The product that you're manufacturing is of a much higher value, and the life safety concern around it means that everything needs to work absolutely as it was designed to. So everything was 100% designed and commissioned. And after a few years in that, I got involved in the buildings industry, where I started to design building management systems. So I was in process control, instrumentation, then went into building management systems. And to be honest with you, it was a bit of a culture shock going into the buildings world because they are miles away from where process control was because it's a very, very different environment. And that's where I was introduced to things called value engineering. And I was introduced to things like commissioning in a week. And 
as we go forward as an industry and buildings become technologically driven, we really think about the way that we approach technology, how it's designed, how it's set up, and how it's commissioned in the future. And maybe the current thoughts aren't really the right way forward for the technology industry. So I spent several years as a contractor looking at specifications and um, designing systems to go into buildings. And then 15 years ago, emigrated over here and became a consultant. And I spent 11 years consulting, three of those really interesting, doing a bit of a gig with Google, understanding what they were trying to do. And with the likes of Google, Microsoft, Amazon, all now coming into our industry, all playing in buildings, it's really, really good for us as an industry because they are opening up so many potential opportunities. And they're really changing up the way that we can think and we can operate. So I have a really unique lens of contractor, consultant, client, and now client. And across those three streams, there are some conflicting interests between the contractor putting in what they've been told to do, but what they've been told to do has certain design elements missing because it's a DNC contract, so they then have to finish the design themselves. The consultant doing the 70% design under the client's instructions. And then the client really having a vision for a building, a vision for technology, but not understanding enough about it to how to execute upon it. And I think that's the big piece that's missing. So I've spent the last three years at Dexas creating technology standards and an execution strategy. Because without that, it's very, very difficult to clearly articulate to the consultants what they need to design and why. And although DNC works very, very well generally, for technology, I think we need to think about a slightly different approach to have much more definition and clarity around it. The other issue that we have is that there's so much investment going into prop tech. So in 2020, there was 180 companies coming out of nowhere, emerging, that were selling technology into property, either to do with leasing systems, to do with IT, smart sensors, you name it, dashboards, platforms, they were all out there. And for a client, that's really, really hard to navigate what's best for my building, what's best for my project. And the investment went through the roof in 2019, dripped because of the COVID, but it's all coming back now. So we've got a massive amount of money being pumped into the prop tech industry. And in amongst all of those products, there are some real nuggets. There's some really, really interesting stuff that's coming out. So I think that the key going forward is to identify what those products will be to really help us improve our efficiency, improve occupant comfort, and future-proof the building as much as we can. And regarding IoT, the devices that sit at the end that do the measurement are almost becoming consumable because they are battery powered, last a few years and something else better comes along. So we also need to consider how do we plug and play this stuff into a building? If everything's hardwired, if everything's very tightly integrated and it's too hard to swap out, then we're gonna get stuck with it. So the whole ecosystem of the building and its fundamentals need to change to be able to adopt that. Because of the hype around smart buildings, if you go onto any search engine and type in smart buildings, you're gonna get some really fancy pictures. And they're all gonna look a little bit like the one on the left. What I'm interested in though is the depth of it all. For our research, we have to look at the hype value, the value it provides. In other words, is there a problem to solve? And does it solve the problem? Costs. Now, costs are changing from a capex to an opex model. 
where a lot of technologies now is going to a subscription. And that really impacts on the valuation of our buildings and our ability to be able to recover those ongoing costs. So we need to be really careful about deploying a technology that one, has great value for us, two, we can swap it out when it becomes out of date, and three, the cost is better than the value that it provides because we're seeing a lot of stuff coming in where the tech is really, really good, but the costs preclude it from being used. And that's because, going back to the investment slide, there's a lot of emerging tech that's coming out and they're desperate to get it to market and start to get coming in. And so they have to reclaim as much as they can. So I think we've we're going to start to see some of these texts fall by the wayside and probably have some real clarity over the next few years of what other really important things to our buildings going forward. The other big factor is scale. And scale is a huge problem for a portfolio. So something that I didn't consider when I was in consulting was the complexities of a portfolio. The buildings have different funding mechanisms with different ownership structures. There's a different management structure as well, which deals with the operational. The building is actually almost like a, a principality. It has its own things going on. We inherit. And that's because there are no standards. So if I design 10 buildings today, and I go to 10 consultants, I'll get 10 flavors. They're all buildings. They'll all have air conditioning. They'll all work but they have different access control systems, different BMS systems, different lift systems. So imagine trying to get to some sort of platform operations when I've got all these different systems, all slightly proprietary, all different data sets. So now start to think about where we've seen dashboards come up in our search for operations. They never really dig deep into how do you get the data from the building into the dashboard and make it work for you seamlessly. Because if it's a real big engineering exercise, you probably won't go ahead and put the platform in. So we have some barriers. As I said, it's standards. And that's one of the first things that really uh, the tech guys that I was working with were talking about was that we have so many variations and so many possibilities, it's very, very difficult to scale out. Some global themes. You've all seen probably these slides before, but automation is the number one thing that's gonna happen over the next few years. And I mean proper automation. And what I mean by that is, if we, if we consider a building management system as it's known today, and as it's designed today, it actually really doesn't do much more than the air conditioning and mechanical systems. It's not really a building management system, and that's because the way it's been procured and contracted previously. That's because when things were changing from the pneumatic and analog days into the digital format, those BMSs were replacing the mechanical system, so they never got the opportunity to spread themselves across to other services, such as picking up energy and lighting and lifts and all the other things that it could pick up. So automation is going to play a very, very big role going forward and more integrated systems. And on the back of that, you'll see some really good AI and ML coming out. That there's claims of AI happening in our industry now, but I think it's very, very limited, to be honest with you, because the data sets aren't quite right. And there's a big push for cloud. That's kind of where I think the future is heading in the next few years. Busy slide, I know, not intending you to try and read it all, but I just wanna pick something out here. This was a KPMG survey, PropTech survey, that was done a couple of years ago. And they're talking about, in the blue, they're talking about the impact that these um, eight core themes will have on our industry. Blue, short term, red, long term. And it's really interesting that they've picked up that 5G down the bottom, they've got a 5% and then a 3% short-term, long-term impact. 
the bit that's missing from that is 5G cannot penetrate buildings because of the frequency it operates at. 4G just about gets into buildings and will probably get you a third of the way across the floor plate. 3G will get you all the way to the center core. That's because the frequencies they're operating at. The higher the frequency, the faster the service. Now 5G has a few different flavors to it. And full-blown 5G uses something called MIMO, where you've got the double density of antennas across the floor plate. So first of all, 5G does impact, because now we've got to work out how to get all these antennas around. Secondly, 5G uses a completely different wiring infrastructure on CAT6. Thirdly, 5G, the standard, which is the MCF, which specifies the equipment that we can use, has not been ratified yet. So if you want to put 5G in a building right now, technically, you can't. And the MCF, we reviewed it, and it's due out probably within the next three or four months. Why I'm focusing on this is because the cost to put a 5G distributed antenna system into a building is three times what it used to be. Now we go back and think about my statement about technology, today's technology, will be out of date in three to five years' time. Now think about the procurement process that we traditionally do, where a builder will put a price in against a set of specifications, go to the supply chain, get them to lock their prices in, and then hopefully win the contract. So imagine the impact it has where we've now got the price in for a 4G, but when we go to design the building and install it, it has to comply to 5G standards. It's a, it's, it's a real challenge, and the biggest challenge we have in the building technology industry is supply chain and how to project out, push procurement, delayed procurement, to make sure that by the time the building is occupied, the technology within it is actually current and not on the verge of going out of date. So, like I was saying with Digital Twin, if you spoke to five people about a Digital Twin, you'd probably get five variations. That's even worse for smart buildings. If you said to some people, what is a smart building? They would come up with their own perception of what a smart building is. There's no real definition for it because of its different things to different people. But I have to say, Memori, who are a group out of Europe, have done a really good way of trying to categorize what happens in a smart building, the things you need to focus on, and how to navigate your way through it. Again, you can find all this stuff on the net. It's downloadable. But I think that the categories that they've come up with, control, conserve, secure, find, optimize, communicate, and personalize, I think they really are the key things that we need to think about when we talk about what sort of experience do we need to design in a smart building? What are the outcomes that we're looking for? And I think they lock it down really, really well. But if you have a look at the right-hand picture, to navigate your way, the systems that interact to create those experiences is actually a very, very complex journey and then think about the data sets that you need to be able to create those experiences as well. So what's the shift? Technology is changing, which means the products are wired differently, communicate differently. So we have to get ready for what the future may look like. If we put in today's technology, and when we do an upgrade, we can't plug the new systems into the old wiring, we have a major problem. So future-proofing is really what we need to consider. Again, it goes back down to infrastructure. Connectivity. Again, if I go back to building systems and I think about the networks that used to go in a building, you may have several systems that were all designed in silos on silo networks. You have the BMS, access control, fire, CCTV, security, all running their own networks all talking proprietary languages, none of them sharing any information. 
Imagine what an upgrade path is going to look like in a few years' time when now they bring out their IP range of controllers, but you can't actually plug the controllers in. The cost is phenomenal to do the upgrade at that point, which is why if we design, we need to look at five years' time, what's the landscape look like, what products are available that I can start to future-proof with. Remote access and identity management has been a huge problem, and it was never really dealt with properly because, again, there were no standards around how do you secure a building, how do you protect it from cybersecurity, and how do you manage the people that are accessing your buildings? So if you think of it, we have a multi-million multi dollar asset, and we're just allowing anybody to access the systems in there that have the ability to shut things down to evacuate the building. But there was no real standards of how you control the identity of those people. And yet, when you talk about the IT world and you go into your corporate environments, everything is managed through your user login. And the corporate IT team have the authority to be able to lock you out if they so wish. So we've got another thing coming at us of how do we control access into buildings, how do we manage the identity of those people, and how do we make sure that when an engineer leaves a company, the access to the building is taken away from them. Communications. So over the years, systems have operated on some quite old technology. So we had something called Modbus that was around for years. I used that back in the day in, um, in PLCs. We had LON that came out of um, Europe in the 90s, and then we had something called BACnet that was created by ASHRAE. And that was to try and come up with a standard way of communicating so we could share information sets. But there's a misconception on BACnet that if you've got a BACnet system, it's open, and therefore anybody can maintain and manage those systems. And that's not there for. It was there. So systems could interoperate. Systems themselves were still designed on a proprietary platform. So protocols have changed. Everything's becoming on an IP, more of a, a, an ICT structure. And there's a lot more requirements for integration between those systems. Open data. It's a double-edged sword. We want things to be open but we want it to be secure as well. How do we manage that? But why it's so important, back to my point about data infrastructure, we have really useful, rich information within our building systems that we can't tap into. And therefore, we really need to make sure that in the new world, we're specifying the open data standards and I'll talk a little bit more about data in a minute. And the transition to cloud, something I call Buildings 35. And the reason why I call it that is that in the corporate world, Microsoft made a decision that you're no longer going to have servers on site, on premises, it's going to go to cloud. And gradually, the industry transitioned to go to cloud. And there was some resistance in the early days of I don't really want our information going up north. But now is on 365 are now starting that transition themselves, where all the systems are being cloud enabled and all the systems are being um, with a subscription to a cloud service. So we also need to think, how do we make our buildings cloud enabled? What do we need to do? So when the cloud does come our way, we can transition very, very easily. And that will then reduce the amount of equipment on site we won't have so many servers, so much hardware infrastructure, and also we'll be pushing up into the cloud environment, hopefully in a format that we can understand. So I've taken a little bit of a, a, bit of a snapshot at the, the short fuse Big Bang just on some of the technologies that we use in our buildings. So right now, every building design has to have a converged network. We did a study um, two years ago on the benefits of converging onto a single network 
versus having multiple networks. And the cybersecurity guys liked the separate networks because you've got air gaps between them. It's security. If one gets breached, the others don't. But converging them meant that you could have one security system to lock the network down, it's managed properly. You'd have one network to manage, and you'd have really good network infrastructure because the networks that were going in under the normal systems were not really designed at high quality ICT standards. They were going in more of a proprietary pieces of wet string kind of a fashion. 5G that I've already talked about, the biggest impact that's gonna have for us is the financials and how we actually design it in, bearing in mind we actually can't select equipment at the moment. IoT, everybody's heard of IoT, and the IoT industry is running ahead. The big things with IoT is the new type of sensors that are coming out. So we're trialing a lot of sensors that sit on something called the LoRaWAN network, which is a, which is a very um, wide-ranging network, battery-enabled sensors, and um, really, really good for monitoring things that you wouldn't traditionally monitor at a really good price point. BMSs, I don't just mean the building management system, I meant all systems that sit in a building are going to dramatically change. They're not going to look like they used to. Like I was saying just now, they won't have servers anymore. They'll all be just pushing straight edge to cloud. You'll probably have your BMS monitoring system that's sitting in a cloud with only edge devices to provide the intelligence. So the infrastructure of those is going to be very, very different. And everything is now starting to get fault detection. Once we pass that, the next three to five years, you'll see cloud really coming in strong. With cloud, you'll get really, really good analytics. Once you get data into a cloud environment, it opens up a whole new world to you. There's so much power in the systems that the Googles, the Microsofts, and the AWSs are providing as part of their suite of, um, of tools. You go way beyond what the proprietary systems in the building could, could provide. And that obviously includes machine learning, artificial intelligence, with the ultimate to digital facilities management. And I think that's where it's going to go in the end. Bit of a chat about data. So data is not data. It's got flavors. And if you pull raw information out of a system, you need to have some context behind it to work out how useful it is. The fat data is basically a variety of data um, that can mislead you if you're really not careful to understand where it's come from and the context behind it. And if you contextualize it, then you get over the thin piece, which is just raw numbers coming out. You don't know where it's come from. You don't know what it is. It's just a bunch of numbers. So the thick data is really what you want ahead, and that's what adds the tribal knowledge. And that's the piece that AI is struggling with at the moment. So you could have a machine looking at a, a, a data set, making decisions, but you could have a very experienced looking at it and going, well, I know it looks like that, but my experience tells me it's this. And nine times out of 10, it's the experienced engineer that's getting it right at the moment. So think about extracting data out of buildings. It's not just a case of pushing it into a data lake and hoping for the best. We really need to understand how do we model it to make use of it? And that's something called an ontology. And without an ontology, really, the relationships of the data will make no sense to us at all. So this in the middle is an extract from something called the brick data model. But there are a few out there. You've heard of Haystack. There's a few others that are coming out now. One of the biggest things that I, I had to work out was how we model the data sets coming out of building systems to make them contextually rich and actually make them insightful. But where does the model sit? Who builds the model? There's, a, another, there's another layer that needs to happen beyond just pulling data into a cloud. And so we are able to, with a data model, in a really, really good structured way, query the information and have the machine tell us exactly what the relationship of the data is with other systems to work out what the root cause is of what we're looking at. Buildings are designed really at the moment by mechanical, electrical, 
via hydraulics consultants. But there's no discipline for building technology. And I think there has to be. Because the technology that we're now looking at goes way beyond those four core disciplines. And we mustn't design in silos. We have to design horizontally, where we've got the devices all going to activity, um, integration platform, extracting data, and then going to applications. The horizontal approach gives us a lot more agility in the future to be able to plug in old and new applications. And now think about the concept of your building becoming a smartphone. If you create the building to have the smartphone operating system, you can apply any application to it for the purpose that you want out of it. So horizontal design is so important, and skill set of building technology also so important to make sure that those subsystems designs are all designed with the right technology in mind, the right connectivity in mind, and the right protocols and data sets. And another new skill is the master systems integrator. So like we had the independent commissioning agent a few years ago, we need to have a commissioning agent for integration. It's a very, very specific skill set. And there are not many MSIs around. I have to say, on the projects I've been working on with an MSI, it's made things so much easier, where they are what, known as the digital Sherpas. They will help all the subcontractors to be able to connect their systems to the network. They'll set up all the schemas. They'll look at all the data sets. And they will qualify the equipment before it's procured. So you also need to consider where the MSI is engaged and how early in the project their engagement is. Because what you can't do is get technology being procured that doesn't quite fit the needs of the building anymore, which means it needs to have two lots of qualifications. One, is it cyber secure? And does it have the data sets that are the requirement for the building? Some observations that I have made. If we don't apply these new practices, these are the typical things that happen. And when I talk to my peers, they all say the same things. That equipment, out of date by PC, quality installation, because of it's been rushed, deficiencies, we get quite a lot of that, and which is why we have to have a long, long, much longer tuning period. The lack of ICT skills, where we've got networks that aren't cyber secure, not well set up, conflicting IP addresses. And we put all of these things out after people now going into occupancy, because that's when the building starts to really operate in fury, and that's when we start to pick up the bricks and the problems. So it's, it's something that really is happening all the time, unless we think execution strategy. How am I going to get this technology into a building? How am I going to make sure that it's qualified, it's cyber secure, the data sets are right? How are we going to make sure that it's actually operating as it was designed to on day one, that the owner gets the keys. So I just want to show you a bit of a case study before I jump off. Um, just before the pandemic, we had an issue where a major customer was asking us for speed gates in one of our buildings. No big deal. But the impact that speed gates have on all of the other in the building meant that how can we create a frictionless entry exit for people that don't want the gates. And we did um, some research around an Idemia product with hand scanning biometrics, where you could just pass your hand through the scanner and it would let you through the speed gates. So we integrated seven technologies, signed visitor management, the Idemia biometrics, access gates, destination control, locker management, car park, and access control. And it was quite a feat of engineering that we had to do to make all those systems share their data, but not just work seamlessly, work very, very quickly. And that was my big worry, that you'd scan your hand and wait, and then the doors would open. And we got it down where it is rapid. And you almost just pass your hand through very, very quickly, and the gates open. Not only did the gates open, 
they tell you which lift to go to. If you're a visitor coming into the building and you're not enrolled on the biometrics, it doesn't matter because we can print you a QR code and you just put the QR code under. It's a shame you can't do it with your mobile phone, but it's because the camera technology and the biometrics can't read reflections. So, a fantastic job for us. It ended up being touchless. Then the pandemic came along, so timing, hey? That was <laughs> pretty thoughtful. Um, adoption, everybody loves it. We've also got it in a, another one of our buildings now. Um, so, so far, what we've done and achieved is really successful, but scalable. Because all those systems in that building are different in the next one, and the next one, and the next one. So think of the to actually implement this technology across the portfolio, where we've got so many different flavors, which goes back to standards. Have a look at this. Pretty cool, huh? But it actually worked. So, just to end, I know I've talked about a, the DNA of a smart building. The things that I've been talking about are really some of the challenges and some of the things that we need to consider. And if you talk about what makes a really smart building, strategy is the number one thing that you have to have. And that means a strategy around your budget, your procurement, your contracting model, and how you're going to execute on your vision. Horizontal design. You mustn't design systems in silos. You must design them on a flat structure where everybody has got good understanding of what the other systems are capable of, with all the data sets pushing north. So when you want to how are the products interoperate together, it's very easy to do. And when you want to do any upgrades, it's as seamless as it can be. Converged connectivity. You have to have a really good data pipeline running up through the building. It has to be secure, and it has to be resilient. And last but not least, open data standards. You need to understand what telemetry you're going to use to push the data north. You need to have it scalable with a topic structure and a defined ontology. So when you start to use the data, you've got some context behind it, and it does what you need it to do. Thank you.